Hey, what's up? Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Simply Pod Logical, a Simply Nail Logical podcast. Hello, everyone. Happy Taco Tuesday. Happy Taco Tuesday. Christy and I have a story time. Oh, no. Story time. Oh, Actually, God. you were there, so I don't need to tell you this story. Okay. I want to tell them the story. Uh-oh. I'm Can't scared. stop thinking about it. After your stream the other day... <laughs> yeah. So Christine did a stream where you were testing the world's blackest paint or something like that. Yes. Uh-huh. Fun. Fun times. We, we go out to get a coffee or a tea. A tea. Correction. Yes. Tea. Correction. Fact check me. Okay. <laughs> no. We go to this coffee shop. Go in there. Order you a English, uh, English breakfast tea latte with oat milk. Yeah. 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 And as we walk in, we notice there's just some lady sitting there. As is normal in a tea shop. It's normal to there's see a lady, a lady sitting, sitting, in, a, sitting, sitting in a, a coffee shop. shop. But like their camera's sort of propped up and it kind of seems like maybe it's following us, right? Yeah. Yeah. Which isn't like, this has happened before. This is something we notice sometimes. Uh, don't necessarily appreciate it because it kind of makes you feel like a zoo animal, but we kind of, it's not the worst thing in the world. Yeah. First world problem, yada, yada, yada. But that's not what was weird about it. So like <laughs> we're, we're sitting there waiting for your tea to be made, to be made. So you, and you have to stand there for a few minutes so we're standing you know, up at the bar it's fancy and look over and she is just staring at us like non-stop and you know how it's like when someone's staring at you maybe like you kind of glance at them and then to they make stop eye looking. contact and then like they'll look away yeah so I, I try to do that like i look up see they're staring they just do not break eye contact so, so there's like, back there's just like a good eyes. five seconds where we're just staring at each other incredibly uncomfortably, okay? <laughs> so that happens. So we know this is happening. You you get your tea. I don't make any eye contact. I never make eye contact with anyone, actually. <laughs> and you kind of like walk on the other side of me. Yeah. Just so like I'm in between them and you. But as we're walking out, this is what I can't stop thinking about. As we're walking out, this person's looking at both of us. Yeah. And they just go, cheater. I, th- I thought you said, hey, cheater. I thought you said, hey, all, cheater. All I heard was cheater. <laughs> and like, I kind of look at her for a second and we look at each other and we just like, we just kept keep walking. walking out of the store. But I can't stop thinking about I'm, this. We like, we totally could have misheard her, yeah. but she was only like two meters away from us. So it's not like, like she was right over there. And it wasn't said in like an angry way or like no. a question. It was just like, hey, cheater. cheater. Hey, cheater. <laughs> it's like, do I know you? And from I'm just somewhere? like, have you seen Ben with other <laughs> ladies at the tea? Has Ben been getting other ladies tea? <laughs> so this is so like we were trying to hypothesize. Or am I the after. cheater because I cheat at water marbling? <laughs> so here, here's our two theories so far. <laughs> okay. One, she recognized me, but didn't recognize you, and, and thought, thought you I was cheating. getting tea for another lady. And clearly, that's definitely cheating. That may yeah. be the case. <laughs> or two, she really likes water marbling. And she's seen your YouTube videos about yeah. how to cheat at water marbling your nails. Yeah. And she just wanted to let you know how much of a cheater or you are for three, that. Or three, she mistook you for someone else completely. You just like maybe look like another guy. And she didn't recognize me, obviously. So she doesn't know Simply Analogical at all. She just thinks you're someone else. But, and you're with another woman. So she's like accusing you. But like, I don't even think she said it at me. I thought she was kind of looking at you. But a- anyway, I, I don't maybe know. Maybe she, th- yeah, I'm cheating. <laughs> if you but like, I don't know. If you have any theories down, it may be the case that this... She wasn't looking at us at all. Well, she was looking at us. This person might just not be well and is just hanging out in a coffee shop. But uh, I just can't stop thinking about it. It's mostly because (laughs) it really looked like we were being recorded. Yeah. That's why we're more like, (laughs) was this directed at us? Yeah. And here's the thing. Like, it could totally be exactly that. Like, maybe this person just, they don't know us at all. And maybe they aren't well. Totally possible. But understand being in our position where every time we go out in the public, there's usually someone who recognizes us. So we're constantly thinking, like, that's probably the case. If someone's looking at us, I always think, oh, it's because they know I'm simply analogical. So I I have lost perspective as an average person (laughs) that just, like, sometimes some people look at you randomly and it it gets weird because I just assume people are looking at me because I'm, like, simply analogical. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It was it was <laughs> the the greatest mystery of the week. <laughs> Most exciting thing that happened this week. Yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, we watched Don't Worry Darling last night. Mm-hmm. We watched a movie, guys. I have thoughts. Had a little date night. We were like, let's yeah. watch a movie. 
Yeah. And uh, it's still in theaters, I think, but you can rent it at home now for like $25, which is kind of insane. Yeah, wasn't it like twenty nine ninety nine? It was like $30 to buy or $25 to rent. What's uh, the we're, difference? We're seeing this off $5. No. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. What's the difference between buying and renting when like, who cares? You're just doing it online. Like you're just buying. You, you're watching it. I really don't know what you're asking When me. you buy a movie yeah. in this day and age I online. I can watch it at any time. At any time. And when you rent it, you can only watch it. For 48 for... hours. Okay. I guess that makes sense. I guess sense. I'm always the one doing like, this. You don't know this. There's nothing to return anymore. You know what I mean? Like there's no like <laughs> there's DVD no that, or block of VHS <laughs> that you're returning. So to me, it's kind of weird. Like I would always just rent. Well, yeah. But if you. Because I don't need to watch if it If you again. think you were going to watch this problem. movie at least one more time, more than 48 hours from now. Is there a limit to how many now? times you can replay it? Or it's like you can watch it infinite times in like 48 hours? I think I can keep watching it in the 48 hours. I, I'm not sure. Or is it just one time you can play it within that 48 hour window? I'm not sure because I've never been like, let's watch that movie again. I don't know. It's very strange to me that there's those two Renting offerings movies. in this concept. In this, anyways, I, I'm, I'm mostly for it. Although <laughs> clearly, you know what's weird? And it was true of Don't Worry Darling as well in the marketing of it, which is a whole other conversation. But... Uh, there's that famous clip of Harry Styles, who's one of the actors in the movie, plays mm-hmm. like the lead, one of the lead roles of the the men, the husbands. Mm-hmm. Uh, he sort of very uh, clumsily describes why you should go see this movie in theaters. And that's something you see with a lot of movies lately. Like studios are clearly telling people in the right. promotion, please tell people to go see this movie in theaters. Because they must make more money at the box office, I, right? It must be the I case don't i don't really know how it works how yeah. they share the money with someone the in the theater comments chains. i'm sure someone <laughs> could explain this but we've gotten a bunch of really odd advertisements for movies in the last two years i would say where it will cut away to like daniel craig being like this james bond movie can only be experienced in movie theaters like, like you have don't to watch, watch this it at in home. the theater <laughs> I know. and that and that's we've talked about this there's some movies that i think you do benefit from seeing sure. on an enormous screen that's probably not true of most movies and most people at home have enormous tvs as well that wasn't the case like 10 years ago don't worry darling in the movies no i i was i did not regret paying 25 (laughs) dollars to see it instead of or do you regret paying (laughs) that's pretty (laughs) expensive to rent a movie it it is very expensive but i get it like we're getting the benefit of being able to watch a movie in theaters okay at home so anyway but harry styles did the exact same thing but it kind of got memed on right because he was like uh it's like a picture show. It's like he 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 didn't know what to say. He didn't really know what to say. It's like it's like a movie that you want to go like see. It's like a movie. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, like, I missed that. He seems like a very lovely guy, but yeah. it's like you see Chris Pine beside him, being like, "What the fuck is this guy talking?" About? Oh man. Okay, so anyway, we saw spoilers. Don't worry, obviously, spoilers. If you wanted to see "Don't Worry, Darling" and didn't want it spoiled, do not watch the rest of this podcast or listen. Um, because we were talking about the plot and, you know, our thoughts. Yes. Yes. Spoilers. Spoiler. Also, like, I kind of <laughs> wanted to watch it because when I first saw the trailer, I actually thought it was, like, super intriguing and looked good. Mm-hmm. And then there was a lot of talk about it being a disaster behind the scenes with the director yeah, and for sure. the main lead actress hating each other. I think that's what it other. attracted a lot of people to and see I it. And I think they sort of leaned into, like, hopefully that viral marketing because the movie isn't getting good reviews or it wasn't screening well so i and i don't think the studio wants to pump like a hundred million dollars into a marketing a movie if they don't think it's actually going to make them money so i do wonder if some like sort of marketing Mm. team got together and was like let's lean into this idea that everyone making the movie hated each other and there was all this controversy just because it made people talk about it so I hear you, and that's the cynical view, which I always appreciate a cynical view. Uh-huh. But I also think that maybe what is rumored to happen probably did take place. Like Florence Pugh was not happy with leadership or Olivia Wilde or whatever. And, I think yeah. like that probably happened, and then they just kind of went with it. Exactly. Yeah. I think the same thing, that it, there's truth to it, and yeah. they just rolled with it. Right. So uh, what is the movie about? So it stars, it's directed by Olivia Wilde. This is the second movie she's ever directed. Mm-hmm. I actually thought it was pretty well directed just from that perspective, just to get that out of the way. Um, And stars Florence Pugh, who is an amazing actress and was excellent in this. Yes. Uh, So it is the movie, what's the 22nd description movie? It's about, it's like a psychological horror thriller where set in this sort of idyllic, it kind of feels like the 1950s. It's a bunch of 
couples or families living in this like company town in the middle of the desert when they have like no no contact with the outside world Uh, and the women have no idea what the men do at work and everything seems like perfect in a very sort of uh traditional uh men's version of what a perfect little society looks like if your wife's just waiting at home for you to make you cook you dinner like 70 years ago yeah yeah um and then slowly Florence Pugh and some other women in the community start realizing like something doesn't feel right that we basically don't have autonomy here Mm -hmm. uh so that's sort of the premise to just get right into the spoilers or criticism yeah. i maybe like there is a critique to be made i think of like the first at least hour of the movie the the biggest issue with this movie i thought was pacing because once the final act sort of starts unraveling like the real story and what's actually going on i actually mm-hmm. thought that was made way more interesting and there's a bunch of threads they could have pulled that could have been really interesting that they just don't But instead you get like over an hour, like the first hour of the movie kind of drags or like even the first 20 minutes feels like you're just watching a music video because it's just like constant like uh, medleys of like 50s like pop songs as like they're like, look how perfect our lives are all just like drinking together. Which was kind of the point, I think. It was the point, but just too much. Yeah, it was the the point to kind of set the scene that everything's idyllic and there's musical interludes between every scene and, and everyone's fancy and happy. But it was overdone to the point where it's like the viewer gets it, or this is my reading of it. I'm like, I understand that you're painting a picture of everything's idyllic, and I'm just waiting for more information to find out like where are the holes in this idyllic world. And yeah. it took a long time for those to actually come. And that was like kind of a frustrating perspective as a viewer. Like, okay, we get it. Where's the plot? Yeah. I, I was literally like, where's the plot after like an hour? Yeah. So the movie starts getting interested when Florence Pugh's character uh, starts really starting to ask questions about why they're there, why things aren't feeling real. What the men do at work. Yeah. She went up to headquarters when they weren't allowed. Yeah. So the women are told yeah. they're not allowed to go to like, here's this physical space you can't go to. This is where all the men go to work, but no one knows what they do. Right? Yeah. And she goes there and sort of blacks out and doesn't really understand what happens. And then when she comes home and she wakes up in her bed, her husband, Harry Styles, basically gaslights her and said, oh, you just woke up here. And you yeah. know, he, he's lying, which the viewer yeah. kind of like you suspect that and then you confirm that later. Yeah. So the, the interesting thing about the movie and the big reveal and twist and spoiler, if you don't want to know what happens in this movie. We already said that like 20 minutes now. ago. <laughs> so it turns out that you get to see what... What they they are in a uh, simulation, let's call it, because mm-hmm. it's revealed that Florence Pugh had a life outside in the real world where she was a doctor who was working a lot, and it's sort of I think it was implied that or indicated that like she was taking on more work because her boyfriend Harry Styles in the real world had either lost his job or is a bit of a deadbeat or something, so. It shows her like she just worked a 30 hour shift, you know, she's a doctor, she, was a doctor, yeah. she comes home and her boyfriend uh, is like mad that she didn't call and he wants to spend time with her and maybe be intimate. And she's like, I just want to have a shower and go to sleep. And then it shows him on a computer like, uh, I don't know, on like some Reddit or Discord and he's it, listening it to- It kind of looked uh, like a forum that I thought represented Reddit. <laughs> yeah. And he's listening to a pot, you hear him listening to a podcast- yeah. That's like, uh, you know, like uh, about like how good the natural order of things should be. And you mm-hmm. are the man you think you are. Yeah. And like. And you deserve what you deserve. It's clearly like yeah. a representation of this guy being uh, red pilled, I think is the term, right? Mm-hmm. Or being, you know, consumed by like incel or alt-right. Basically, you know. yeah. It gave off like men who think they deserve more from women yes. and think that they deserve to control what a woman does and chooses, like if it's Mm -hmm. their partner. That's the vibe you got, but there was only... That's not just the vibe, that's like the very... Sorry, yeah, (laughs) okay. yeah. clearly what it's trying to But here's the thing, there was only two minutes in the movie where you actually saw saw this scene of Harry Styles in the real world looking disheveled, kind of like a loser. Like that that was the point, I think, Mm -hmm. um, to paint him that way in the real world, which was the opposite of him in the idyllic world. Um, but it's like, you only have two minutes as a viewer to see that, oh, he's actually this kind of like schlubby guy on a computer, like just wishing for this thing. And he is the one who co-opted her to 
enter the simulation and like basically held her hostage. Yeah. So what what is happening here is that men are uh, are signing up for this service where they have a woman who they are like uh, putting under using like it kind of looked pretty stupid like they put like something on their eyes. She's she's it's tied. Like clockwork orange. She's tied to thing. a bed. Yeah. And she's just like plugged into a computer simulation mm -hmm. against her uh, free will uh, for them to live in this like 1950s uh, paradise of his making or the weirdo like men's right cult leader who is the Chris Pine character. Mm -hmm. He is like the sort of architect of this world where these men can sign up and pay for getting to live in this world that is like... Uh, the ideal reality for men who want women just to be subservient to them. So, so this is really interesting. Like mm -hmm. I, th this plot, once you finally get there, I think is like fascinating from a, ooh, interesting, so many things to explore. Yeah. But it was like kind of lacking uh, like logical sense. I mean, it's supposed to be a thriller that's like dystopian. I get it. It isn't real. <laughs> but it just, it had too many holes because... The only glimpse we saw of Florence Pugh's character in the real world was her as a doctor, which presumably like a lot of people would notice if you're just missing. Yes. <laughs> so like all we know is that we think is that Harry Styles' character uh, just basically kidnapped her and held her hostage and they were previously in, re in a relationship. Yeah. So during the screening process or what we're to understand is Harry Styles' entry into the this world, it was like previous re relationship, yes. So to me, that uh -huh. signifies like in the screening, they're like asking, is your partner someone that you previously knew or not? Because they need to know that for like, yes. you know, control purposes to make sure nothing gets out. But what doesn't make sense is like, so what? He just hooks her up against her will one night, probably like drugged her, I guess. And she's just always in the simulation. And in the real world, no one noticed this doctor just like went missing. No one's checking their house when they know she's in a relationship with him. It makes no sense. <laughs> yeah. So I guess in the logic of this world, when the men inside the simulation, when all the men are going to work at headquarters, they're really exiting the simulation yeah. to make money so they can keep paying for the service of existing in this fake world with their right. wives who don't know what's going on. But yeah, you make an excellent point here. It doesn't really hold up to much thought, the idea that there's a bunch of women who were in relationships with these, with these men that just go completely missing, missing and no and one's, no one's asking questions. What well, would have made it way more realistic. This is my idea. <laughs> and yeah, we talked about this right after the film. Do you want to say it? It's Sure, sure, yeah. I think like, although really fucking sad, but true and could have done a better job at like making a meaningful social commentary here was if the women who were forced into the simulation against their will were not like prestigious doctors or whatever, but they were more transient women who were overlooked and vulnerable populations. Absolutely. And I feel like that would have done a better job at adding to that social commentary. Like who's the most likely woman in society to be co-opted by men like this, to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And I think it would have also been more realistic in the story that people in the real world wouldn't have missed those types of women and it's like really fucking sad and heartbreaking but i feel like that could have been so much stronger of a plot point to add that kind of extra layer to uh like commenting on us as a society not just like feminism women's rights but also like vulnerable marginalized women in society being overlooked and being abused absolutely and and yeah other people have made this criticism too and and for me it also just doesn't I'm usually not someone who gets like super hung up on plot holes. Like I can enjoy a good movie even if like a premise doesn't totally make sense, you mm -hmm. know, but th the idea that like these incel guys who are attracted to this idea of just getting plugged into a computer where their wives are just uh, unaware of what's going on, they don't. They don't already they wouldn't have be the Florence guy Pugh. with yeah Florence Pugh. <laughs> Who's a doctor. They're like, not dating Florence Pugh right. otherwise. You know what I mean? And and, and there was some interesting threads at the end of the movie of like, it, it turns out one of the women in there has chosen to be in there mm. because it's sort of implied that her children died that in the Olivia real world. That was Olivia Wilde's character. Yeah. And, and by plugging herself in, it gives her an opportunity to live a life with a family that she lost on the outside. That is like 60 seconds of the movie comes and goes. And like that would have been way more interesting to explore than seeing them having another party in the first hour of the movie. You know what yeah. I mean? Or, you know, so Chris Pine's character exists in this world. He's like the architect. He's the, uh, Olivia Wilde said he was inspired by Jordan Peterson, which makes it really funny. 
I wish they had leaned into that more. Because he's like the charismatic leader just convincing people by saying a lot of words but not saying anything. That's... But like they have the power of men. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, what's... Uh, what what's... would we do without <laughs> men? <laughs> exactly. Like what's the... What's the enemy of progress? And this guy goes, chaos. And they're like, and yeah. They're like, yeah. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, we just said something. You, you, okay. You're right, yeah. though. Like, the, the way it's like Jordan Peterson is like a lot of words are coming out of his mouth and almost like none of it really signifies anything at all. Yeah. It's great. Um, but uh, so like, the, uh, you know, the, the Chris Pine character at the end, like shit's hitting the fan. Florence Pugh realizes she's, she, she becomes self-aware of this, this, this isn't real. And that her boyfriend has taken away her autonomy and locked her into this world. And she kills him. And by killing him in the simulation, kills him outside. Which and doesn't make sense. Nope. That and Chris Pine character, uh, <laughs> it, like, is alerted to the fact that one of the people in there died. So they want to kill her so she doesn't get out and, and tell expose everyone their and, whole thing. Yeah. And the movie kind of ends on, like, a somewhat gray area. But it's, you, you hear her sort of, like, breathe, wake up. Which I think to me implies that she gets out because she makes it to headquarters. and Yeah, but I, I also feel like I was really interested in what does that reality look like for all those people in the simulation? And what does she look like when she wakes up? I wanted to see her like breathe that real life air, see Harry Styles beside her dead and have some kind of like realization. That's what it was missing. I mean, that's not the only I don't thing that think was missing. That's missing. I think but that's was, what I was like, yes, I let know. me see the outside world. I can't wait. It's like the Matrix. I think it was good enough to sort of hear her wake up. No, but I'm I kind want of more. I'm kind of a sucker for an uh I like sort of abrupt like an obtuse semi ambiguous ending. endings. Like yeah. the ending of uh Inception. Uh, do I have to say spoiler alert? This movie came out. So like I, I like a movie that leaves something to your imagination. Yeah, I hate it. You don't like no, that. No, I was don't like, use your I'm so thirsty to see the real world after this <laughs> event and see her like be able to tell her story. Or I need a conclusion. And maybe it's just like I'm more fascinated by the behind the scenes of the storyline. The idyllic world was mm -hmm. like what essentially like gets the viewer invested and interested. And then you're supposed to be like, whoa, that's not actually it. But I wanted to see the behind the scenes of this fake world. And we only yeah. got a few minutes of it, which was really frustrating. Yeah. So we didn't really pull out that thread of women who chose to enter into this world. And we didn't pull the thread of Chris Pine's character at the very end just gets stabbed. Oh, yeah. Randomly. <laughs> his wife in that world. And which there, like... There was no foreshadowing or anything that like maybe she was there against her will like, or... we don't know. Maybe she knows what's going on, but she just wants to become the sort of... Leader now. God of that fake world they've created like, for these people. You're basically left to assume like, okay, I guess she just kind of realized and now she hates men and what he did, but like it came out of nowhere and there was no context. It made no sense. She just stabs him. Like, but but what? it makes me think, it, I wonder if there's like deleted scenes that flesh out a few of these other plot lines a little bit more and i wonder if this movie could be way better if it was like re-edited to condense mm. the first hour and maybe explore some things in the second half that maybe just kind of got left on the cutting room floor i absolutely agree with you and maybe that did happen because usually mm. it's my understanding that they will go generally in at movies sorry <laughs> i <I'm> malfunctioned okay? <laughs> it's a simulation <laughs> We just got a glitch. I malfunction. I glitch. Oh, no. Now you know the truth. I know. I locked you in here. It's for your own good, Christine, oh God, so we could be out, happy. Let me out. Let me out. Okay. It's my understanding that oftentimes editors and directors will go through a series of like, how does this laid out? Let's reframe that, re-edit that, re redo that. So maybe they did that. And when you do that too much, you stop seeing it properly. Because you're absolutely right. The first hour could have totally been cut down in order yeah. to explore and just make more sense out of the plot holes. And they didn't even necessarily like have to film more. But maybe they just didn't even film those scenes, yeah. which would mean they couldn't have inserted them. And yeah, there's a reason why there's often like director's cuts Menchie. of movies. Jesus, relax. Everyone's glitching today. I know, seriously. Actually, speaking of that glitch thing and what we were just joking about, that was a really interesting, maybe the most interesting part of the movie was the exchanges between Florence Pugh and Harry Styles when she really realizes that she has been uh, locked into this, that he has locked her into this world. Mm -hmm. Because I actually thought the most, the most interesting thing portrayed in this movie was sort of his rationalization of why he did it. 
and trying to convince her he did it for her. I thought that was actually really interesting. Yes. It's this idea that like, hey, you actually hated your job being a successful doctor. Look, look what I've given you in this world. I have to leave and go back into the shitty real world all day to mm -hmm. work to keep us in here and pay to keep us in here. Be grateful. While you get to live yeah. this idyllic lifestyle in here. And the obvious response and her response is like, but like, I, I didn't, didn't consent, I didn't yeah. decide that. Like you took the autonomy away from me, yeah. but him rationalizing to himself that he is not the bad guy. That was, I thought a super interesting commentary. And I feel like so many people could relate to that. So many people have known of or have been with a man who had this like antiquated view of like there to be responsible for your relationship and your life outcomes. And it's based in this like really traditional old school mindset that that's the man's household, head of household. And uh, yeah, I definitely think that came across. So Olivia Wilde did a good job, I think, at communicating that and his Harry Styles character's logic and rationalization. Like, this is what you would have wanted because you were unhappy. So I took it into my own hands. Be grateful to me for bringing you into this. Yeah. And it's like, you are not the mastermind of her happiness. Mm -hmm. And just because she worked really hard as a doctor and like, yes, was stressed or whatever, that that was her choice to do so because she even responded to him in this conversation like i liked working yeah <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> but i liked working <laughs> like <laughs> i do want to acknowledge though because anytime we touch on any topic close to this or talk about the fact that we don't want to get married or have kids i know there's always people in the comments who think we're basically judging women who do choose that who like are totally happy being stay-at-home moms and things like that I think this movie is a good opportunity to be like, we don't have a criticism, or I at least, I don't have a criticism of people who want to adhere to those like very traditional uh, gender roles or family values or like stay-at-home mom. Like my mom was a stay-at-home mom. Like I have a lot of respect for people who choose to do that or stay-at-home parents in general. It's also more generational though. Like of course, a lot of people's parents listening to this. But I, I'm, yeah. I don't have any, I don't have any judgment in me for mm -hmm. that. But what... I think we think and what the movie is saying is that there needs to be like some autonomy for the woman and her choosing of that and her yeah. not being trapped into that by mm -hmm. a man or other sort of by societal hold, forces or holding it over her head saying I make the money I need to do this like yeah. I think that's kind of what we're supposed to glean from that yeah yeah anyway I just wanted to throw that out there what do you think of the acting in the movie so Florence Pugh is an amazing actress. I've never seen her not be good in something. Yeah, good point. And sometimes, like, you put a really good actor or actress in a really bad movie, and, like, it's just they can't act their way out of it. So that definitely wasn't the case here. She's amazing. I know people are goofing on Harry Styles here. Mm -hmm. This is, like, the first, I think, more, like, real role he's ever done. Because he's been in a few movies already, I think. This is the first time I've seen him in a movie where he has like a lead role. Yeah. And I, I don't want to say he's a bad actor. I think he's just obviously outmatched by how good of an actress Florence Pugh is. I think that's my take on it. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not saying he's bad. I mean, he did a better job than I could have done. <laughs> like, well, I'm <laughs> not on. an actor. I used to be, but it's not quite the same. Yeah. Um, he could probably act in a Fib Finder commercial or well, something. Well, yeah, just he would fine. sell them all if yeah. he acted in a Fib Finder. They'd be <laughs> yeah, sold yeah. out for 10 years <laughs> uh -huh. if he was on there. Um, I think like my uninformed analysis of him mm. in that role is that it was an incredibly difficult role to play because it was so layered. So what I mean by that is you have to play a man who is con who is in the idyllic world that he loves, he's like kind of responsible for his woman, he's the leader, he's going to work or whatever, but who's also aware that in the real world he's held his woman hostage to do this. Mm -hmm. And how do you act in that sense when the two get into an argument about like something, like when he was trying to gaslight her, for example. Yeah. Um, how do you act that when like you're getting mad at her because you're trying to put her in her place, but you also know that you're guilty of something that is such an incredibly nuanced acting plight. It's like, I thought he did a lot of like good primary acting, which I'm defining as him like doing the anger in the scene as He's required by the, the right scene. He's conveying the right emotion and saying the right lines. For that lines. scene. Yeah. But there's like 
a secondary layer of acting that takes into account the entire narrative and the nuance of like maybe the insecure, more incel person acting angry in this context, which is what you learn later. And that didn't really come through, but like how hard would it be <laughs> to act that? Like it's well, really yeah. complex. And how many people can really pull that off, right? Because yeah. really what, what you're referring to, I think is like, like character actors, like people who aren't just reading lines, they're like really embody the character. And sometimes mm. that's like super pretentious. Well, I'm not telling and him to do this offset. That's not the same thing. No, no, no. I, I know. But I think like people associate it with that same idea, you know, like a Daniel Day Lewis who yeah, is like, that's not what I mean. who pretends he's like Lincoln when the cameras aren't even rolling. But he, but he's doing method that. Acting. He's doing that. Yeah. Me sorry, method acting, you're right. He's doing that. So he is like embodying the character and not just reading lines off a page, right? Right. That is a technique to wholly absorb all the uh -huh. elements of the character. But there's tons of amazing actors who don't do that don't on set, who do don't that. do method yeah. acting and can still uh, provide a layered, nuanced, can like yeah. convey uh, whatever the emotion is they're supposed to in that scene. But also within it, you feel the narrative of that character th throughout the movie or the TV series. Mm -hmm. Anyways, it's just my uninformed criticism. You know, one of my, my favorite actors ever uh, is Marlon Brando. Okay. Uh, and there were stories of like him on the Godfather set. Like he was a method actor, I think you would say. I don't think he really accepted that label, but he was sort of known for like he would just act like who he thought the person would be rather than That's really it. even knowing his lines sometimes. And there are scenes in that movie where like if you listen to commentary from like directors or co-stars where they're like, Oh yeah, Marlon Brando put a post-it note on my forehead in this scene because the camera couldn't see it, but just to like remind him of what his lines were supposed to be. Oh yeah. It's pretty awesome. I would yeah. totally need that. I post would totally notes. need my lines everywhere. <laughs> just post it on just the other actors. Notes. <laughs> uh, anything else to say about this movie? Do you think it did a good job at like commenting on what it was supposed to comment on? I think there's some things it did well. Like, I, I did appreciate kind of this uh, example of what can happen in the abuse where if you put together a group of men that just, like, think they're correct and show how that kind of spreads on the internet, although they only did that in two minutes, I wish that was more explored because that is more something we could take away and apply to current society. I thought, like, that was really interesting to me. And I was like, ooh, yes, we're but going here. But I guess here. when you say, like, what the movie wanted to say... I don't even know if the movie said a whole lot about any of this. Like, it's kind of like, here is the harm or danger or like a, mm -hmm. a literal expression of what men with this thought process would do if they had the power to do it, more so than it was making any sort of like uh, grand or nuanced statements about feminism or anything like that. It's kind of just like... Well, no, it still was saying that, kind of as we discussed, that men who kind of have that belief don't allow their woman to have much choice because they see their woman as like theirs to take and theirs to put into a simulation, their careers to absorb or whatever. So that kind of was pretty forthcoming to me. Yeah, but that's not that's not really anything new. Yeah. Well, well what's new is that it was it was framed as if it was like 1950s, but it was clearly modern day because it was simulation technology to allow it to happen. So I wonder if there, she's also trying to comment on like the viability of an actual uh, like virtual reality, like a metaverse. And is this going to happen? I, I just, I guess I just don't really feel like it really explored these themes as much as had a very sort of superficial, like uh, these sort of incel men's rights, people are the ideology of that mm -hmm. really boils down to just controlling women and their bodies. You know what I mean? And like, I'm not saying that like, that's a good, I, I think that's an interesting message to build a movie around, but I don't think it really dug deep into any more sort of a lot of like nuance around those ideas so much. Yeah. I wanted more. Once we learned of that, I wanted more about the kind of the backstory and yeah. how they all got there and how the women, that's another plot hole. Like, okay, we learned about Florence Pugh's character that they were previously in a relationship. She was a doctor. We saw that mm -hmm. and we saw that he was basically holding her hostage in their house. Yes. But the other woman, apart from Olivia Wilde's character who chose at her own free will to enter the simulation because yes. she could have the children she lost in the simulation. We don't know how all the other women arrived there and under what context. Because there's a scene in the movie where they're having dinner 
and uh, Florence Pugh's character starts to piece together, isn't it convenient or isn't it a coincidence that we all met our partners in Pennsylvania, Boston, or something else? Like, I forget where. And that how did you meet? Isn't it um, a coincidence that a lot of you guys met your partners because you picked up a lost train ticket or something? Like, like, And she's just trying to be like, isn't that a coincidence? And trying to point out that this reality is fake. Well, but, yeah, but... but we never understood as the viewer why there were those particular coincidences. Is it because the men in these groups were like I... all located in these three areas? No, no, I, th I think you miss... I... How did I misunderstand? Explain it to me then. No, I think like these women are... Some of the women are like Olivia Wilde that have chosen to be there. It kind of seems like that might be the case of not just her. But why are they all But for most of the then? others, I think it's strongly implied that they are like Florence Pugh. The men have signed them up to be in there. That's sort of revealed at the end when Florence Pugh's trying to escape. You see some of the other women start to become kind of self-aware in the yeah. same way. But the reason they all have the same backstory yeah. and Florence Pugh is like kind of trying to point that out to them is because my assumption is that when they've got uploaded into this virtual reality, they've, they've just been sort of brainwashed into like having some sort of backstory that gives them some historical context for how they ended up here. Mm. And I guess they just recycled that script for a few of them. So they just copy pasted the script. So, yeah. Because it was that was. So easier. it's not like in the real world, a bunch of them got kidnapped on trains, that, picking up that's a train what I was ticket. Thinking. You thought, oh, like, okay. I mean, I, I get, don't think that's what it is. I feel it's... like you could interpret it either way, though. Because, like, I hear you. It but would... we know with Florence Pugh, it's like she thought she met him somehow. But no, she's just a doctor who got tied to a bed somewhere. It, right. it, your interpretation, I don't think. But makes the other sense. woman, maybe they did get kidnapped through a train ticket thing. I think we're supposed to believe it's a lot of like Florence Pugh types with like people who were in a previously. But it's that yeah. one line when they were reading out like uh, screener questions to Harry Styles, like the computer program was just like previous relationship, yes, which to me implies there could be there people could without be a no. previous relationship. And so that's where I was like, oh, the way of kidnapping women might have been like, oh, hey, miss, you lost this ticket, or and then like meeting them. Um, encouraging them to come back to their house and then kidnapping them. Again, that sort of speaks to your idea of like, it's a much more terrifying and believable concept here if it is vulnerable women being coerced. Yeah, or... except they weren't really vulnerable women, or at least like the movie did not paint them as such. The movie didn't yeah. go to any length to go into that, those Which, layers. Which I think that was definitely missed. I feel like that would have been a way stronger movie and commentary mm -hmm. but whatever yeah and for us like i mean it's only it's a two-hour movie so there's only so much it can do just watch the last hour no i'm just kidding <laughs> but like for us like it was right after we watched it like we started talking a little bit about like the hands made handmaid's tale which yeah. is a show you really like mm -hmm. and over the coast course of four seasons five has it or is it five seasons now yeah. is this last season nope there's gonna be a six it's gonna be one more or praise like a be. second <laughs> praise be under his eye uh like this is a show also about uh, men controlling women's bodies or society controlling women's mm -hmm. bodies. And it has very much built a world around it in a very nuanced way that explores a lot of like similar themes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess could be read as like feminist uh, art or literature or movies or show, whatever you want to say, that like has built a world that feels... More real. Yeah. It's... Yeah, it's more real, it's way more sophisticated, and it uses the political lens to also communicate how women are co-opted by a group of men, basically, in Gilead, which is their version of the new America, kind of the new world order. It's, it's similar language, but yeah. just a different building of a world where they use women to basically, like, have their kids. Yeah, so the, hand, the 22nd explanation of The Handmaid's Tale is... Uh... In a world where women are growing increasingly infertile, uh, like hyper-religious military group over uh, takes over the United States and women are basically relegated to like the property of men for the purposes of having babies mm -hmm. or at least certain classes or categories of women. Yeah. Right? So that's the premise of that show in a nutshell. And an incredibly depressing show to watch. I only watched the first season and I felt like I kind of... It was really good and well made, and it just felt like I don't know if I need to keep watching. People this. definitely had that criticism because the the main character June Osborne. There's just so much shit that happens to her, and it's like how bad can it get every time? Every time she's just being oppressed and like terrible things and trauma, and like how how does this make sense for it yeah. to continue forever? I honestly think they heard that feedback, and this season looks different. I'm not saying season there's five. not there's not hardships, but well, and there should be yeah. in a show like that. It's not like everything should be 
we won. Yeah. You know what I mean? But still. I just think that show, and I mean, I will say it's because it's been five seasons and it's based on like a best-selling novel. So obviously the plot is way more thought out. Only the first season was best based on the book, though, yeah, is my good, understanding. Yeah, great point. Well, didn't they have Margaret Atwood's like, so Mar- guidance? Yeah, so the writer, Margaret Atwood might be like the most famous Canadian writer ever. Anyway, uh, she wrote this book a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, the first season is the whole book. But she's involved in the show. In, right. And I think since then she's even written. I think she did write a sequel alongside. Yeah. Since the movie. But that's why I'm not surprised that when you have like an amazing writer like that based on a a book that's been highly rated for decades. Yeah. And then uh, screenwriters and, you know, getting together and there's five seasons now. I'm not surprised that obviously that does a way better sophisticated communication of like a commentary on women's rights, basically. Whereas this single movie directed by Olivia Wilde, not based on a book that had already explored the nuance and underlying mm-hmm. themes. I'm not surprised that the latter one has more plot holes and like I'm kind of like missing something. Mm-hmm. So, you know, whatever. It's not a fair comparison. So would recommend Handmaid's Tale, at least the first season. Although... Uh, no, all of them. Although warning for incredibly heavy, sensitive content. Yes. Um, probably wouldn't recommend Don't Worry Darling. Like if it's on your streaming service, I wouldn't not recommend it. It's it's in that weird area for me where it's like not really good enough for me to care about it to really in, want to recommend it, but it's not like bad enough to make it interesting or funny for being bad. Cuz I was secretly hoping this would either be like actually a good movie mm. that we wanted to talk about or it might be so bad and like a dumpster fire and that would be funny to talk about. And it kind of wasn't either. I found, like, I'm not saying it's terrible. I found myself really liking the general storyline. Like, if you just read a quick synopsis, that's absolutely the type of movie that interests me. Mm -hmm. But I always kind of judge a movie or a show based on how much I think about it after I saw it. And I thought about this one a lot, but just in terms of like how they could have explored more of of that reality, like (laughs) kind of like in the matrix where you see them in the simulation quite often, but then you also see reality and that kind of payoff is there. You see them all in their little pods and you see Neo in like, you know, the real world or whatever. (laughs) So that's what was missing from this to really make me like actually interested in. But I actually think that's kind of a counter example to what you're saying. The matrix was better just after the first movie without i think doing all the world building of what life outside of the matrix was and sometimes movies Mm. are better when they leave some of these things to imagination that's because it was like a sequel problem sometimes when you keep doing sequels to movies that are so good but to to me i just think the the themes of the matrix were really well fleshed out without having to give you that world building yeah whereas i think the real ideas and substance of what don't worry darling is trying to say would have benefited from sort of exploring some of the things the mis- the movie left unsaid or unrevealed whereas like in a movie like the matrix i actually think it's we were sort of better off or not uh, maybe that's a little harsh those second that second and third movie uh, have have their issues but there actually is sort of a cohesive story to the three of them that's interesting at the same time anyway i don't know how this turns into matrix talk uh what about the cinematography like the visuals did you find anything interesting it was fine. It was fine. Okay, well, I'm say. more interested in that kind of stuff. Like, I love playing with depth of field, and I uh-huh. kind of noticed those things or how they use light. I thought it was really well done, the scenes where they had the dancers, and they were in the shape of a circle, kind of like to look like the eyeball. The way they used light on their legs to make it look like the eyeball had, like, the color strings and the eyeball were flickering, I thought that was actually really well directed. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I just no, that's like fine. That. Yeah. <laughs> Such a specific thing. It's very specific. It. I thought it was okay. like amazing that scene. That's why it ended yeah, up being yeah. a scene that was more elaborated in the credits because they wanted to use it because it looked so good. I, I think the broader comment there is this movie was made by people who know how to make a movie that looks good. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, just uh, yeah. Just, okay. Is that... <laughs> but I just sure yeah. <laughs> so, what do you think of the metaverse? Would you go in a simulation? Not necessarily Facebooks, but like any other one. <laughs> I don't know. What am I signing up for? Are you trying to sign me up without my consent here? Well, no. You'd have to <laughs> sign up like at your own free will. But would you do it at your own free will? I don't know. Not not 
as I've seen some clips of uh, Facebook's little metaverse mm. there, it doesn't look like it's it for me. Yeah, it does not interest does me not at all. Um, I do not want an idyllic world. I actually prefer a world where it's harder, realer, and requires a lot of problem solving. So that's just me. <laughs> I would, I would I rather mean, suffer. I don't doubt that there will come a time where a lot of people would mm -hmm. volunteer to sign up for a better virtual existence than the one they have in the real world. Yeah. I think that's something that's probably coming sooner than we realize. Yeah, and you're right. There would absolutely be certain people who that, to them, might make more sense for them. Yeah. yeah. I can't see the majority of the population signing up for that, though. I don't know. The ethics of it will be really interesting, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> Maybe to end on a bit of a light note, kind of like I was getting at before, like this movie wasn't really great, but it wasn't bad enough to be good in a bad sort of way. I want to I wanna tell you, Christine, about two movies that are so bad that I think they're kind of good in how bad they are. You okay with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay. First one's called Mac and Me. Have you ever heard of Mac and Me? No. Who's in it? Uh, I don't know. But it's about a, it's about an alien. It's, there's nobody in it. Like oh. it doesn't matter who's in it. Okay, <laughs> that's but, not the right question. Well, I was just trying to understand if I'd seen it. I'll tell you about the movie. Okay, it's okay. It's about an alien ends up on Earth, gets separated from their family. Okay. The FBI, the government, is trying to catch this alien, but the alien ends up in like this family's home where a young boy is trying to help the alien reunite with his family. Does this sound familiar, Christy? E.T. This is the plot of E.T. Oh, so this this movie <laughs> Mac Mac and Me is the same was plot? made like six years after E. T. as a shameless ripoff of E. T. Oh, but the difference is Mac and Me was kind of made to be a movie, but also made to be like an advertisement for McDonald's. <laughs> so what? It's the plot of E. T. But then there's like extended dance sequences in McDonald's with Ronald McDonald. Is that why it's called Mac? A Big Mac. So. It's called Mac because that's, that's an acronym for same way E.T. was extraterrestrial. Mac is like some stands for something of like to say represent an alien. I can't remember. Major what it alien is. community. Ma yeah, I something like I don't know. I can't remember. But but this movie is like uh, it's so bad. It like shows up on lists of people saying like it's one of the worst movies ever made. And it kind of has a bit of a cult following now. Was it funded by McDonald's? So the producer had a relationship, McDonald's, and it was partly funded by a food distribution company that had a relationship with McDonald's, but there isn't that like explicit oh, McDonald's just okay. gave them a bunch of money to make it, but like... But you know who is catering on set? Ronald McDonald. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, you can find clips of it online, but it, it's kind of, it's somewhat famous now because of a running gag on the Conan O'Brien show. Mm. So, you know, Paul Rudd yeah. plays Ant-Man, the least cool superhero ever. Um, he would come on the show. He's been coming on Conan O'Brien for like the last 20 years to promote whatever movie he was most recently in. And I guess as a joke, they thought it would be funny of like, you know how when they're on like the Tonight Show or shows like that, they go like, hey, here's a clip from my new movie. Mm -hmm. Instead of playing a clip from his new movie. He just plays that? They would show a clip from this awful movie, Mac and Me. Oh. And at first it was just like, what the fuck are they doing? It was just kind of like, I guess that's funny and confusing. But now it's funny because they've been doing it for like the last 20 years. 20 years? They've been, this gag has been running a long, long time. They've been playing the wrong, they've been playing the wrong. Yeah, every clip. time Paul Rudd comes on the Conan Only when Paul Rudd, show, okay, not other Yeah, no, actors. only, only Paul Rudd. So like the first time they did it when he was like talking about being in the finale of Friends. So what was that? That was in the 90s, right? And they just played and Mac so, and Me as a joke. Yeah. And the, the clip they play is one that's, when I literally describe it, is going to sound horrifying, but you have to see it to okay. kind of understand it's funny. The, the kid in this, you know in E.T., the kids are all like riding on bikes? Yeah. So in this one, instead, this kid's in a wheelchair, right? Mm -hmm. And there's this scene where this kid, uh, sort of like accident happens, and this kid starts rolling down a hill in a wheelchair. And he tries to pull on the brakes and the brakes don't go. And he's just flying down this hill. <laughs> and this girl, the little girl's like, oh, no, he's going down the hill. And it just shows this little boy in a wheelchair just got launched off this cliff <laughs> and fall like 100 feet down into a lake and a big splash. And then you just see this alien head pop up and go like, oh. <laughs> 
wait, wait, what? Just this alien pops up. So is the boy the alien? No, the alien is just sees the ball, boy fall into the lake. So he picks up the so boy? So the alien rescues the boy after the scene. But just that 15 seconds of footage, maybe we could just splice it in here. I don't know if I'll get claimed or not. But it's just like one of the greatest unintentionally hilarious things ever. Oh, my God. that's And the movie's from when? 20 years ago? Or like 30 uh, years ago? Uh, 88. 1988. That's as old as we are. That is as old as we are. That's 34 years old. <laughs> Oh yeah. my God! What a time! We should we should watch Mac and Me tonight. Should we? Yeah. I don't know. You know, it doesn't I, only if Paul Rudd's in it. No, <laughs> I'm sorry, he's not. We could pretend he is. He plays the alien. Sure, sure. Okay, anyway, well, just just a little nugget for you there. Yeah, that sounds more uplifting. I do need some more <laughs> uplifting content to watch. Yeah, after can we all watch this a depression. happy happy movie? Yeah, I just not the, about the, women the, being kind of me. <laughs> Someone know. recommend a, a feel good movie. Have you seen Chef? No. What's that about? Chef's a feel good movie. It's like John Cooking? Favreau. Baking? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> How did you know? <laughs> it's about a guy who uh, kind of rekindles his love of food and family through mm. like starting a food truck. It sounds too and wholesome. Traveling a country. It's super wholesome. Yeah. But sometimes don't you just need a movie that just, I don't know, just feels good, makes you feel good? I don't know. I just find it so unrealistic. <laughs> like, oh my God. <laughs> I mean, okay, that's not to say that I don't enjoy other types of television that, or not television, but like shows that aren't like funny or entertaining. I do. Like we watch a lot of like reality television or whatever. That's more entertaining. That isn't uh, Handmaid's Tale society. Sure. That's going like under. sort of like trash, like watching a car crash though. That's not like yeah. feel good happy happy theme music you know i feel like there's less and less content that is what you're describing now that i'm thinking about it i feel like there used to be way more like rom-coms and family christmas movies that just came out in abundance all the time i think they, and now there's they just still, less of those being produced they still exist they're just on like the women's television channel but exactly or, like the average yeah. person who's like into me social media or, or, or digital media isn't getting those types of things promoted to them anymore yeah. as much. And maybe that's just a reflection of the algorithm and our own decisions kind of moving away from like, I don't need this random ass Christmas movie with Tim Allen in, in it anymore. <laughs> I'm like kind of past that point <laughs> in my life. <laughs> but like, I don't know. I just feel like there's like less like that. Yeah. Or maybe it's just like kids movies mostly do that. But but you're right. Yeah. There used to be mainstream movies like romantic comedies. Mm -hmm. the, the, the sort of 90s idea of romantic comedies comedies has just sort of died right yeah you no one's laughing anymore there, it's isn't not that funny. sort of well, like julia roberts funny, style because <laughs> it's really not like that humor does not like it's just not funny for the most part i don't know okay yeah yeah but people's tastes have changed society's gotten dark and so here we are with the we just need some Handmaid's good we want some good news i want some good news don't worry darling <laughs> Okay, thank you for listening. Hope everyone has a fantastic, uplifting Taco Tuesday. And then she stands <laughs> up as, like I, as I said, uplifting. <laughs> she listened. You go, girl. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see y'all later. later. Bye.